Well, this morning we come to look at this continued issue of the sin of partiality. And this is part two. Last Sunday we started it. And it's so interesting how the events that are around us in our culture so often mix with the very sermons that we are looking at. Here we are on 9-11 Sunday, and even in the midst of this, as we will recognize at the end of this service um, a special moment of remembering the attacks upon our land 15 years ago today, we also recognize that even amidst that, there is not only division from radical Islam against America, but even within America, there is great division. Even within our culture that um, we, this very often the American life has been called the American experiment or the whole, the whole concept of America has been one big experiment. And there's sometimes when we progress forward and then there's other times that when we, we come back and we, we struggle with things and here we are in the midst of a struggle. Some aspects of that struggle have great merit. There's, there's been great injustices, of course, over the last 350 years, but even when we thought many of those were over, we see undeniable evidence that some of those still exist greatly and the, that, are, that are greatly divisive, greatly dividing in our culture. Real issues where real people are struggling with things. And then, and then as well as we seek to deal with that, we don't really deal with it rightly very often. And there's, there's all kinds of, of confusion and continued division instead of really solving the problems as we should. And part of that is because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world that has said no to the grand design of the Creator. We live in a world that has rejected what He has said is good and right. And so our hearts are individualized. And so there is a confusion that comes about where there is a great partiality that exists in so many different ways. And it's not only today in America in 2016. But listen to this, 2,000 years ago, these issues were very, very much a part of the human race problems. And they were very much a part of the early church, even as folks were coming and discovering that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that they have had the Messiah come to them in their generation. Many of them saw and heard what he said. Many of them saw what he did. Many of them believed upon him. Christianity started to grow, and it grew powerfully. But yet, all of these nagging human problems of division kept creeping in even to Christ's followers after they had discovered the truth. And has the church continued to deal with that since the first century? Indeed it has. The Lord knows our fallenness. He died for it. He knows it all well, and he's called us to read and to see his word and to see what he says until this short little life is over and we are finally with him in glory, in his presence. But this morning we come to this passage of James again that is dealing with this, and we're giving these 13 verses the proper attention that they need, not just because we see it in our present day all around us, but because we see it in our own hearts so very often. And I pray that the Lord uses this in our minds and in our hearts this morning. I want us to remember. Um, let's go to the review statements that are here. And uh, for those of you that are new to us this morning, this number one and number two especially will be very helpful to you because you're diving in in the midst of a series and we want you to understand where we've been. 
And so look at review statement number one. Pastor James, he's a pastor in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Pastor James of the Jerusalem church is calling early what kind of Christians? Jewish Christians, so they were Jews. This letter, this particular letter, is written to Jewish congregations that have come to Christ, Jewish Christians who are spread around the world to deeply evaluate whether or not they have, this is important, true saving belief in Jesus. In the process, he also shares wisdom, instruction, encouragement in a very, do you remember what we said about this? James is in a very, he, if you read the book of James, it is very direct and it's very no nonsense. Pastor James didn't use flowery language. He got straight to the business. He got straight to the issues. In fact, we saw that when we look at verse 2 of the book of James, James chapter 1 and verse 2, and he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you go through various trials. I mean, so the big question that's on everybody's mind, what about all these troubles? If God is for us, what, what, I mean, why do we have all these struggles? If Jesus died to save us from our sins, why are the Romans still hounding us? Why do we still have pestilence? Why do we still have all kinds of famine? Why is the world in upheaval? Why is my own life having trouble? It, I mean, I've been, I came to Jesus and then I got run out of Jerusalem by the, the Jews who didn't come to Jesus or by the Romans themselves. So James doesn't mess around. In that first verse, or excuse me, in the second verse, he immediately just bowls into the problems that are on their mind. He says, consider it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the test of your faith, testing of your faith is going to bring about endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, making you mature and complete, lacking in nothing. I mean, he, he just goes for it. Well, when we get to chapter 2, we see that once again, he just goes for it. He doesn't mince words. He's concerned that these folks really know the Lord and are living like it. So look at number 2 here. In chapter 2, review statement says, in chapter 2, Pastor James, circle the word, blasts. He blasts the sinful tendency of man to show partiality toward others. Right above the word partiality, favoritism. The idea that you, that you would just show these favor, favoristic tendencies where you like some but not others. You give some honor but not others. Notice here, he blasts that. Last week, we focused on the fact that throughout, the, and this is so important, throughout the Bible, we see that God is, fill it in, impartial and no respecter of men based upon appearances. We see that God, as so often the Scripture shows us, that he has a much bigger agenda that is far beyond our fallenness. And so, James bowls straight into this, and we see throughout the Scripture that God is an impartial God. Look at number three. This unpacks that a little bit. We said this in that last week. Man looks on the outside while God looks on the inside. With God, internals trump externals. With God, internals are more important. They supersede the externals. In fact, we said this, that the heart is always the issue. You see, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside, and he made the heart, he knows the heart, he deals with you. Now, um, uh, let me warn you of a common thing. In this present day and time of, of much religion and spirituality, there are many in our culture that would be very prone towards saying this. Well, you know, everything, everything's fine with me and God because, you know, I know my heart is right, and I just have to trust my heart. How many times have you heard, well, you know, just follow your heart. You have to just follow your heart. You have to trust your heart. Just right out there to the side of that little phrase that says the heart is always the issue, right out there to the side, Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17.9 says, 
the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? We have to recognize that we cannot trust our hearts. Now, I know that there are certain things. I'm a mother. I didn't say I'm a mother. I was that when a mother is what I meant to say. When a mother is, is taking care of an infant and, and she just kind of knows what to do, she, 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 she's trusting in, in some God-given um, uh, instincts that are there and some good training that is there, and she just kind of knows how to take care of that baby and, 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 and to, so in, in that sense, okay, it's, it's, there's some good things there to trust in that you, that you experience that. But let me tell you, when it comes to the issue of your heart before God, there's one place where our heart needs to be before God and it is broken. When we have a broken heart toward God, recognizing we are broken and need to be fixed. You see, this is the, 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 here's the picture, that we are Paul, part of a fallen world. We're in a fallen state. And when we come to God in our brokenness, then we're finally able to see what he wants us to see and to do what he wants us to see. You see, we're, we're not saying, I don't need you, God. What we're saying is, I need you, God. I, I'm, I'm broken. I need you to fix me. I need you to fix my mind. I need you to fix my thinking. You know, if the world would turn to God and just say, Lord, we're broken. You, you can fix us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You see that wicked heart problem, Jeremiah 17, 9. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. That's, that is the picture of how we deal with a, a sinful heart before God. So, before you go around saying, declaring to everybody how you're trusting your heart, you know, you, everybody, that's a very common thing. I mean, it's, it's just as common as, well, how do you get to God? How do you get right with God? Will you just be a good person? You keep the Ten Commandments. You, you know, you, you do these good things and God will accept you. Well, if, if that's kind of your mentality, please don't leave here today without somebody saying, uh, I mean, without going to someone and saying, please explain to me why that's not right. Because that is a, a common mistake that we rely on the things and the philosophies of the world. The world looks on the outside. God looks on the inside. And the safest place on the inside to be before God is broken. Okay, number four. While man can show partiality in many different areas, James highlights the issue of socioeconomic status as the potential dividing point at hand. So James is not talking about other issues at the moment that is there. He's using an illustration. Now listen, that doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to other issues. We're going to see next week how all of this applies to many other areas of life of partiality. But for this morning, Last Sunday, we looked at the impartiality of God. This morning, we look at the partiality in the church and the, the issues of that, and it is centered around a key problem that was going on in the early church. So let's go to the page two, just on the back side, and fill it in. We see in the book of James the reality of rich and poor in the church. In this passage that we've read over and over and over again, we see that there is a reality of rich and poor. Now, I know I just told all of you to turn the page over, but we need to read the passage, right? The most important thing here is the passage. So go back to the box, or if you have your Bible open, you can look in your Bible. But let, let's make sure that we read the passage, and then we're going to see it. And we're going to see what he's talking about. We're going we're to really dive into it and look at it. But I want you to see the passage in James chapter 2 and verse 1. Remember, we highlighted that first principle because it's, it, it sets the tone for the rest of these 13 verses. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. My brothers, 
show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Verse 2, for if a man, here's the illustration, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, stand over there, sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges, underline it, with evil thoughts? Look at verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Verse 7, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you are what? Read it out loud. Committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been to become accountable for all of it. For if he said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak and so act at those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the picture that you are putting forth judgments that are not right and pure and good judgments. You are looking at others and you are prejudging them. Now over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at and see where is it appropriate for Christians to judge, for God's people to judge themselves, for God's people to judge the people around them, for God's people to judge the world. You say, well, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say judge not lest you be judged? Yes, we're going to look at what that means. That's one of the most misquoted passages in the Bible in this present day. The idea is that we're to be undiscerning, indiscriminate in our lives. Absolutely not. We, are, we must be very vigilant and very careful in our, our understanding of the world around us and the perspectives that are around us. But this morning we come and we want to see this illustration that James gives. Look at the first one and fill it in, the reality of rich and poor in the church. This is a reality that James deals with. James immediately is, is dealing with it because it is an issue that involves the people of God. And I, I just want you to notice with me that as we, as we look at this, we're, we're looking even far before James, and we'll be looking after James in this reality of rich and poor in the church. Look, look with me, and number one, consider the prominence of poverty in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. There, this, was, this was very much a part of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, coming to the earth. Now let me tell you, that if I was God and I came to the earth, I wouldn't have done it the way Jesus did it. If you were God, you had created the whole shebang, and you're coming down to show them that you love them, would you have done all of the issues of humility in order to show your love for them, I kind of doubt it. Our God is an amazing God. He's an amazing God who not only can, can create the world in the fashion that he has and make all that he has made, and, and even when the world rejects him, he comes to us in the most beautifully, listen to this, the most beautifully condescending way. Condescending isn't a bad word all the time. When you condescend to your toddler, that's a good thing, right? You come down and you descend to them. You come to be with them. You come to deal with them. You come to them on their level. 
And that is the picture that we see of this creator God that he condescends to us in Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, being made in the form of a man. He did not regard an uh, equality with God, a thing to be held on to, but he left the halls of heaven and he comes to be with us. And he comes to us in the most humble of ways so that we, listen, that we might see the heart of God. The fact that our great and glorious, powerful, righteous and holy God is also, listen to this, a God who is ultimately humble. A God who is ultimately loving even when he doesn't have to be. But he is because it's who he is. And we see that. Notice letter A here. God comes to us in, the, in Christ Jesus. He is born to what? A poor couple. He's born to a poor couple who has... Who, who are, where are they from? They're from a poor area that's Nazareth. Later on, we see in the Scripture that the, the Pharisees down in Jerusalem say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? you got to be kidding me. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. That, that's a place of uneducated bumpkins up there by Lake Galilee. I mean, you got to be kidding me. And so here he, he comes to a poor couple in a poor area and, and he's born in a desperate place. A desperate place. You remember with me. He was born in a stable because there was no room even in an inn for him. The census was going on. All the hotels were full. The bed and breakfasts were full. And they show up and Mary is going into labor. And the guy innkeeper just says, look, everybody's down for the night. Everybody's asleep. I don't... Here, come here, and, and they lay out some hay, you would imagine, and the Son of God is born in an animal stall. The creator of the universe enters this world in abject poverty. I mean, I've never heard another story of someone being born in a horse's stall. Heard this week that Mrs. Getzman was born on the side of the road. She, she went home to be with the Lord last week. And um, this morning, or yesterday morning during the funeral, I found out that they were coming from one state to the other state, thought that they had plenty of time before her birth, and she was born alongside the road in the back of a car. Kind of amazing. But this is a horse's stable. And under unseemingly, excuse me, under seemingly scandalous circumstances. Why do we say that? Because she, his mother wasn't even married. So he, he comes into the world with the rejection poised and focused upon him. His... Joseph and Mary are engaged, but by the Holy Spirit, he is conceived. And this was all God's design to show us something, to show us his glorious plan. So we need to consider the poverty of, of Christ. But, but notice letter B there, his opening public message of his ministry. In, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, he, it, it says, and he stands up in the synagogue to read a passage of Scripture, and he reads from Isaiah 61. And you know what Isaiah 61 says? That it is his ministry to come and to proclaim liberty to the captives and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord to the, the people who are in poverty. And it's, listen, it's not just about economic poverty. It's about those whose hearts are broken to him and realize they need him. But we see 
the prominence of poverty. So the very first minister, excuse me, the very first message that Jesus ever preaches, the very first words come from Isaiah 61 that say that I have come to the downcast. I have come to those who are in poverty. Poverty of heart and circumstances. What about letter C? You remember this. His most known public message of his earthly ministry, right out there to the side, the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, his opening words are, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. And and Luke, it's interesting, um, records it just slightly differently, and and we would account for that by the fact that Jesus probably did give that message over and over again. Um, But the picture is is that in Matthew chapter 5 and in in Luke chapter 6, it is, the picture is, blessed are those who realize that they do not have what is necessary before God, that they are broken, that they are without hope. Letter D, think about Jesus' voluminous attention, just volumes to the matter of money. Jesus dealt with the issue of money more than any other singular issue. He brings it up in illustrations. He challenges our hearts with it. He knows that there, is, there, is the, there are those who have nothing at all practically to those who have a little bit to those who have much. And he's challenging us concerning what we do, how we view, how we hold on to the things of money. Look at letter E. Yet we see, even though all of these things, from his birth to his messages to the subject matter, but notice in his death, his earthly burial is in a rich man's tomb. And that is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 9, that he will be with a rich man in his death. It's this beautiful picture that God is exalting. Listen to this. God is exalting the death of Christ as that which is going to bring the greatest riches and the greatest benefit to this human people. So in his birth, he's born in a cow stall. In his death, he's buried in a rich man's tomb. And that rich man's tomb is going to get blown open by the power of God three days later as he rises from the dead, showing the world that he has overcome sin and death. Number two, consider the predominantly middle to lower class nature of the church. The church predominantly is middle and lower class. They, if you look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, the, all these people get saved in Jerusalem, and they don't have anything. And so people are actually, I mean, they're coming together. They don't have anything, hardly at all. And of course, many of them were there for Pentecost, but, but there were others that lived in the city, and they were, they were rather desperate. And there's, there's people who have something selling what they own in order to help feed and help take care of those who don't have anything. The church is not filled with upper-class people. The church tends to be filled with middle- and lower-class people. And we're going to get to why that is in just a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29, we see this again. And the, and the, the picture is, is that not many of the people are wealthy, not many of the people are educated, not many of the people are cultured. That's what those verses say. Paul said, I came to you, you didn't have much, you didn't have, in fact, most of you were considered of no account to the rest of the world. Celsus was an anti-Christian pagan philosopher in the second century. He was kind of a Christopher, Christopher Hitchens of his day, for those of you who pay attention to many of these things. But he, he, just, he characterized in his writings, these Christians, 
These Christians are a poor, uneducated, uncultured lot. I mean, this is an outside the Bible account in the second century, about the year 178. Uh, we think he would have written that. And, and his, his commentary on these Christians that were spreading everywhere were that they, they, they didn't have very much. They, they weren't very respectable. I mean, if you really wanted to see a movement that would be a political movement that would take anything, that would have any value, if you wanted to see some social movement that would have any value, it needs to be at least with people that are respectable and influential. And these Christians, they don't hold the esteem of the world. But notice with me that even though from the inside of the Bible, from the, be, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, through what we see in the Scripture, even to the pagan philosophers around the church, we also see, though, that there is the upper class in the church as well. Not nearly the same numbers. The masses of the church are, are much more the middle and lower class. There's no doubt about it. But there's also a, a prominent list of, of those who happen to come from the upper class that Jesus changed their hearts to. You see, Jesus didn't just come for the poverty. He didn't just come for those who are poor in the things of this life. But there were upper class, there were the wealthy, there were the rich who would hear the gospel and be changed too. And you just have to see this list. Notice with me, Jerem or John chapter 19, Joseph of Arimathea. As Jesus dies, he's with a, a rich man. That, that was the man who buried Jesus in that wealthy tomb. In Acts chapter 2 and 4, the ones that we mentioned just a minute ago, someone was selling possessions. Someone had stuff to sell. There were wealthy people that were giving in, in a part of that that we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. In Acts chapter 6, a great number of priests, it said, came to believe. Maybe even some of those who had rejected Jesus, some of those who had, who had really persecuted him, we know that, that some of them came to faith. But priests, by and large, were not considered the beggars. They were not considered the poor. They, they were supported through the, the work of the temple, and they were supported through the work of the synagogue, but they were coming to faith. So not everybody was a beggar. Look at verse 8, or Acts chapter 8. A powerful man who served as a financial manager for Candace, as the queen of Ethiopia. Philip led this guy to the Lord on the side of the road. He, he was the Ethiopian eunuch. He was, a, he was a powerful person who went back to Ethiopia as a believer. Look at Acts 10, Cornelius, a wealthy centurion, he converted to Christ, and his household converted to Christ. The idea of his household, he had a house, he had many people that were there. People came to Christ, and we're part of that. Uh, there was a man named Sergius Paulus, and Sergius Paul, or you could say Paulus, I guess. Sergius Paulus was a high-ranking official, official. In fact, if you go to modern-day Turkey, you can find stones that have been archaeologically dug up, and they have his name on them as a, as a Roman proconsul that was there. So here is a, here is a high-ranking Roman official that Paul and Barnabas led to the Lord. It's a very interesting story. You ought to read it in Acts chapter 13. I mean, there was a world war going on in the spiritual realm over this guy, Sergius. In fact, Paul declared um, for a magician that was following them around to, to distract and try to keep this guy from believing. Paul said to him, you will not see for a time. And the magician was struck blind. And Sergius came to faith in Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, Lydia was a seller of purple. Now, I would put it like this. What does that mean, seller of purple? Well, she was a dealer of Halton, Halston dresses or Rolex watches. It, it wasn't just that she had a little market there on the side street selling purple fabric. No, purple fabric was a very, very precious and valuable thing, probably a silk. But, it, but it, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing that only the royalty and the rich would wear. And here, here Lydia is, is named as one who was an influential one that 
was there. And we, we see in all of these that they're not heralded for their greatness. They're not elevated to these positions. It's simply mentioned that amidst the masses, there were other influential people coming to faith in Christ. In Acts chapter 17, if you read that chapter, you'll find that not a few of the leading women of Thessalonica believed. These were, these were influencers in the culture. These were, these were upper class in a very large city of Thessaloniki, or Thessalonica. In Acts chapter 18, Priscilla and Aquila, and Aquila are entrepreneurial couple with a tent-making company. You say, well, how do you know that they weren't just sitting alongside the road with a, you know, a, a needle and thread and some fabric? Well, it says that the church used to meet in their house. And it was not a small church. The church used to meet in their house, so apparently Priscilla and Aquila had a pretty good thing going, and they would meet together. So in the, in the economy of things, yes, the church by and large is the average person and even down to those who are desperate, but nevertheless, we see woven through the whole thing just as through every generation and really in every church there is the upper class that is there as well. And you see, this brings glory to God. Generally speaking, you can, you can fill this in and, and see this throughout the Scripture. Generally speaking, poorer people respond to God more than richer people. Poorer people respond more to God than richer people. Well, why is that? Let me first say what it has nothing to do with. It has nothing to do with God preferring poor people's hearts more than rich people's hearts. That, that's not what it's about. It has to do with the fact that the poor, fill it in, in their hardship are more likely to look to God than do the rich in their self-sufficiency. Did not Jesus say, one of his most prominent statements that he made was, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Because if you have much in this life, you're not inclined to look beyond this life for hope and help and healing. You tend to look at what is all available to you. And we are a part of this insidious deception of the world that we are subtly deceived that we're better. Or we're subtly deceived that we've got it good. Because we compare ourselves to others. And in our comparison to others, we have a sense of self-sufficiency and we tend to be happy that compared to some, I'm not like that. Now, the problem for that is, is that even Bill Gates and even Warren Buffett and even all of these others that seem to have the glories of all that this world has to offer, if they could just see what heaven looks like, they would say, I'm a pauper. I have nothing because the things of this life are very deceptive. And this dynamic is very deceptive. You see, it comes from us comparing ourselves to others. And so the poor, when they look up, and they look up from their low position and they say, oh man, I, I don't have much. And there's a, there's a sense of brokenness in what Jesus was saying, that there was a sense of despair that it makes their hearts more open to hear of a God of grace that supplies needs. Notice that Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8, and I've printed it on the outline, keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. And here's the reason why. That I may not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? 
or that I may not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, I, I, I just want you to see that middle part of the verse where the, the picture is, is that the rich are very often tempted to rely on their own things in comparison to others. Nevertheless, fill it in, this verse tells us, a poor man can still reject God in his misery. Just because you're poor does not mean you're godly. There are many ungodly poor people who even though they are in the brokenness of their poverty, they still do not look to God. In fact, they curse God. And instead of looking to his hand for help, they simply reject his hand in their misery and in their pride. But a rich man as well, this verse would indicate to us, a rich man can still accept God in his affluence. Jesus didn't say it's impossible for a rich man to make it to heaven. He just said it's awfully difficult. You say, well, wouldn't that be speaking of hyperbole, eye of a needle, and was it talking about a certain wall and a certain portal in the, in the city of Jerusalem, and there, you know, there's debate about what, what exactly was that talking about? No, I, I think Jesus was just saying that, listen, friends, if you're wealthy and you have much in this life, you better watch out that your heart does not reject God. You see, really, fill this in, our fallen sinful state causes every human to be utterly bankrupt before God. Whether they know it or not, this is the case. Our fallen sinful state means that we are bankrupt before God. Bill Gates is bankrupt. Warren Buffett is bankrupt. Every person that you've ever looked at and thought, wow, look at everything they've got. Listen, you can just put on there chapter 13, chapter 11. They're, they're bankrupt before God. All of the yachts and all of the lands and all of the bank accounts and all of the Halston dresses and all of the Rolexes and all of the other things will... will in, they will not only not do anything for you on the day of your death, they might cause you to miss what it means to be broken before God. The riches of this life are really just a phantom. They're an illusion. They, they make us think that we're something that we're not. And, and I want you to see the passage, and go ahead and put up the passage uh, in front of you, and just everybody look at the screen, and this comes from just what we looked at in James 1, and this isn't on your outline, it's only on the screen. James 1 says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, verse 10, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls off, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man, he will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So the, the idea of James here, he's speaking in wisdom literature terms, which means in general, if you follow the ways of this world that the rich are pursuing these things, perhaps, if that's where you think, if you're of the typical mindset of this, you're going to fade away. So we see this juxtaposition. Not only do we see the reality of rich and poor in the church, flip your sheet over and fill this one in, we see the reaction to the rich and the poor, and this is seen in this verse that we're studying. There's a reaction. So we, we've looked at the fact that God is impartial. We've looked at the fact that Jesus began his ministry in poverty. The fact of the matter is that there's rich and poor in the church. But what is our reaction? And that's what James is getting at. Pastor James gives a very, fill it in, or just kind of notice there, Pastor James gives a very practical, real-life illustration that tests, underline it, the mentality and the spirituality the mentality and the spirituality of early Christians and churches. So James is looking at them saying, look, if this happens, look, this is part of a test. 
Are you really children of God? Because if you're really children of God, you're not going to do this. You're not going to act like this. That's a message for us in this day and time. Look at verse 2, what he says. Here's the illustration that he gives. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man's shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In verse 2, I, I just want to glide through these and, and, and just we're going to leave the passages up so as we go through these and we'll highlight that so you can see the thing. He starts off with a for if. You see, that's at the beginning of the paragraph. So it's a hypothetical, but it's very probable. And there's some who would say that James is dealing with this because it was a really common problem at this moment in the history of the church. There were a lot of Jewish Christians that were across the gamut. Many were very poor, and some were very wealthy. And that would really go with the scenario of what we've said, that they fled persecution. And then they're fleeing persecution. They went to established areas where there were already Jews, and some of those people started getting saved as they heard the message of Christ. So not before long, you've got Jewish synagogues that are becoming churches all over the Mediterranean world and perhaps off to the east where everybody's spread out and some of them are new arrivals because of the persecution that they fled and so they're new to town, they don't have anything, they're poor and others are wealthy and you, you see this and then word gets out that something's happening so over these years, over these perhaps decade or two all this movement is happening in the growth of the early church you can just imagine it and there comes this conflict now notice what he says here, a man wearing a gold ring. And this is literally a gold-fingered man. This is interesting. It's rings were a symbol, fill it in, of status. Now they, they didn't have fancy cars to drive around. Um, they lived in places that were pretty small streets, and so there wasn't a ton of carriages except when they were moving from town to town perhaps. And that was most likely in um, various, various ways, some with wheels, some where they were actually carried. But wealthy people would often show off their status with rings. Do we live in a culture now where people love to show off their wealth? Very often we do. You, you look around, you go to Hollywood, you know, you go to Miami, Hollywood, California, you, you go to Miami Beach, you, go to, you, you hear about all these homes, there's all these TV shows about how opulent homes are built. I saw, saw a show about a guy who built a $15 million house on the marsh in South Carolina, and it was just, I, as I was sitting there watching it, and this, this retired gentleman who had uh, worked real hard and saved a lot of money and built this glorious mansion. And he was just so proud of this and so proud of that. And, and, and he was talking, well, I designed this this way and I designed this this way and this was imported from Italy and this came from China and this was brought in from here. And, and it, recently on vacation, we went to the Biltmore House, the largest house in America. It's on display. And it was all about, it, it was this ostentatious show of wealth. So whereas it may be through a house or it may be through a jet, in this day and time, it was very often with rings, especially when they were out and about. In fact, there were ring rental companies in the Mediterranean world. You could go and rent rings if you had a special event. And it would be very commonly that they would put rings on every single finger except the middle finger, and I don't know the cultural significance of that, but <laughs> seriously, they, they didn't, I don't know why, but even the thumbs had rings. And so it was a show of wealth. It was, it was like the big house, it was like the jet, it was like the helicopter, it was like the fancy car, it was like the fancy purse. It was a show of that. And you know, I know that here in our largely Christian culture of a church, we tend to shy away from that, not always, but we, we tend to, but if you were to go to the country clubs here in South Florida, if you were to go to certain neighborhoods here in South Florida, if you were to go to certain um, other social groups and places here in South Florida, you would see that 
that, that the whole image thing is very much alive and, and well, right? Well, that was very much the case here. And so this guy comes in, and he's called a gold-fingered man, and, and, and the idea is that he would, he would be showing off status. And it doesn't say just gold finger, but look also there in the, in the paragraph. It says, in fine clothing. Now, the interesting word there is lampra. In lampra, what, what do you see in that? It, it, the idea of lamp or, or the, the idea of brightness, light. These are bright, shining, magnificent clothes. Bright and shiny. These are either a, a really bright white or perhaps a metallic woven material, a gold laced or a silver laced material. Or perhaps it was bright clothing um, that, was, that would have come from special dyes from other places. So this guy comes in and he's pretty ostentatious. He's got gold on his fingers. He's got bright clothes. It's obvious that somebody has arrived that has a lot, is the idea. Now, there's no sin in that. There's no sin in a wealthy guy showing up to come to a Christian gathering. I mean, maybe he's coming to, to learn. Maybe it's God's plan that he would come and be, hear the gospel and be saved. See, there's, there's no sin in that. And, and just like, look at the next part here, it's a beggar comes in, a poor man. And the, the term literally here is one who crouches over. That, that's the idea of the beggar. He's the guy that's crouched over. He's standing there all day long, so he gets tired of standing. So what does he do? He crouches down and he's by the gates. And he's, he's just begging. He's tired. So the, the Greek word is actually one who crouches. That's a beggar. And he comes in with what kind of clothing? Shabby clothing. The term there is vile, filthy, disgusting clothing. The idea is the shirt that he has on or the robe that he has on is the only one he's got. He walks around in it during the day. He maybe works and sweats, and gets it dirty. And he sleeps in it at night. It's all he's got. Keeps him from being naked. That's it. So these two guys come in on a Sunday morning, Friday morning, in their assembly, but Christians met typically on Sunday, celebrating the resurrection of Christ, and then begins what Paul or what James is dealing with. Now, I want you to have an idea here with me, and, and notice these images. I'm, I'm going to show you some images of, uh, and go ahead and jump to the pictures that are there. A uh, typical synagogue, this would have been a humble synagogue, a small one, um, and you can kind of get a little bit more scale there. There's some tourists in this one. These have been excavated and um, dug up and reconstructed. But here's a good diagram of maybe a larger one. That here, here th they would have synagogues, and, and, and there would be large ones, there would be small ones. Uh, the next one is an aerial picture of the, the synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus would have taught in this synagogue. Jesus would have gone uh, to synagogue in this very one. And you can see it's a little bit larger. Here's the same one from an, uh, a ground view. And you see the the sides, the steps along the sides, and people would sit around those. And, the, you know, several hundred people could be in that synagogue. Here's some images from uh, dramatic depictions that have been done, the Jesus film. And you, so you get a little bit more of a picture of them gathering together, some in very humble states, some um, probably in, in larger, wealthier states. But nevertheless, you, you see that they would be gathering together for worship, and many of them at this point, of course, as we said, Jewish Christians. Now, this last picture I want you to see, notice that there's a bench that is there. And we, we kind of, we would think that there would be some who have benches, and they would even be placed right in the front, Josephus tells us, a historian, or along the sides, and we see that 
the rich man comes in and the poor man comes in and some say to the rich man, you go sit over here in this place of honor. This is a good seat. No column is blocking your view. You know, the air conditioning doesn't blow on you too hard here. It's really great. Um, sit right here. It'll be perfect. Um, and to the poor man, they go, oh, yeah, come on in. Sit over there. Sit wherever you like. Just, just sit down. In fact, we see some pretty despicable treatment here. Notice what he says here on, on the outline here. To the rich man, you say, sit here honorably. That's literally what it means. To the poor man, you say, stand over there. So it's not, you, you see, with the rich man, it's here. It's come here by me. I'm going to bring you to a nice place. You can sit here. You're, you're really doing that. But to the poor man, you're like, uh, yeah, sit over there. You're not taking him there. There's nothing wrong with telling the rich man, great, glad that you came in, sit here. There's nothing wrong with honoring someone, even a rich man. Nothing wrong with that, honoring him, bringing him in, sitting here. And then, but when you step across the line where you say to the poor guy, go sit over there, now we have a problem. Nothing wrong with the rich man being rich, nothing wrong with the poor man being poor. Nothing wrong with the rich man coming to church. Nothing wrong with the poor man coming to church. Nothing wrong with honoring the rich man and giving him a seat of honor. Nothing wrong with that. But when you distinguish and you say to the poor guy, over there, buddy, or come sit not on my footstool, this says, but sit beside my footstool. Look what it says in my notes. Stand over there, sit beside the footstool of me. The word is hupo, and it's usually translated under, but it would be hard to sit under a footstool. It also means beside. And so this is deplorable. The guy who's saying this has a nice chair. He even has a footstool, and he's going to sit there and watch church while he tells the new guy that came in because he's poor, okay, just sit down here beside my footstool while I prop my feet up. Are you getting a picture of what James is dealing with? And maybe even doing that to keep the poor guy in his place. This is despicable. This is against the heart of God. Look with me at verse 4, at the top of the page, verse 4. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with what kind of thoughts? Evil thoughts. Now, under those notes for verse 4, notice here that the word here is to distinguish. It's to distinguish. It's to divide. It can also be the word for doubt. In fact, it's used more times to depict the idea of doubt in other places where it's translated in the New Testament than to distinguish. And so here's the idea. You're doubting this guy's worth. You're doubting things about him. You're saying, yeah, he's probably that way because of, you know, whatever. You're, you're doubting. And you're looking on the outside while God knows the whole story, the true story. And look at the next part there. You become judges with evil thoughts. And the, the word evil there is the, the word vicious your, your evil thoughts, they're just not, oh, you shouldn't do that. They're wicked. And they're viciously wicked. You see, this is a big problem to God. Might we be prone to do this very thing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a minute to think about that. I have two questions here, two groups of questions here, and I want you to just take a minute. 
And I want you to think about this problem of partiality. I want you to think about when you go to Publix or when you go to Walmart or when you go to a family member that you have that lives somewhere. When you go to the mall, when you're getting dressed to go somewhere, when you're online looking at clothes and looking at things, jewelry, why are you, what, what's going through your mind at those points? Are we prone to do the very thing that James is warning against? As people come into our church, do we look at them and draw conclusions? The next question is, why is this such a big problem to God? Is it a big problem to God? Listen to the message last week. Maybe get your notes out and review the message from last week in light of this message. It may help it become deeper. I hope that you do that. This is the reason we provide the notes. Now, next week is going to be a half sheet. We're going back to half sheets. But I've wanted to lay a groundwork here, guys, that we would really understand this passage and that we would have a picture of what is important to God. And the issue is our hearts. The reason this is important to God is because God pays attention to the heart. Look at Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, therefore, look what it says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And why? For the glory of God. Look at the, look at the red words that I've highlighted on the screen. All of these words about unity. All of these words about relational togetherness with God and with people. This is why it's a big problem to God. Jesus died so that we can be united with God and with people around us. Jesus died to restore the relational construction of our soul that he has made us to relate. That's why relationships can hurt so bad, that they can be cut and broken. They weren't designed to do that. They're designed to be together in unity. That's why a right relationship feels and is so rewarding, and that's why a broken relationship feels so painful. One is righteousness. The other one is sin. God made us this way. He made us to be in right relationship with Him and one another. So the answer is this. Why is this a problem to God? Because God is all about, fill it in, relationship. Flowing out of His very nature is the rich, rewarding, reconciling, uniting, life-giving acceptance which comes from his true love. This is why James 2 is important. This is why we are not to be partial. This is why we are to accept one another in love, to welcome one another with joy. This is why we can have what should be characterized and convicted in our hearts as evil thoughts in our fallen nature. When we begin to see people as the image of God, 
instead of the image of our culture, we begin to know what God wants us to know. Would you stand with me for prayer?